Hi, I'm CM Cushions, and I am the author of Beast, John Bonham and the Rise of Led Zeppelin, the new biography from Hachette Books. It's out in September of this year, and on September 7th, I'm very honored that at Mr. Music Head Gallery in West Hollywood, we're going to have a special book launch event where I'm going to do a reading from the book, do a signing, answer some questions, also showing exclusive photos from the book. So I hope all John Bonham fans, Led Zeppelin fans, music fans, art fans, book fans, and anyone who's in the area and just loves the history of rock and roll in Los Angeles will stop down to Mr. Music Head so that we can celebrate the life and music of Led Zeppelin and John Bonham. So thank you so much. Hope to see you there. In anticipation of the event at Mr. Music Head on September 7th, uh, I actually have some preliminary questions. I would love to talk about the book a little bit. These are also very great questions, by the way. Here are some questions from the gallery itself. Uh, is the approach to doing a book on Warren Zevon about a pianist, singer, songwriter different from tackling a hard rock drummer? Absolutely. Uh, my first book, Nothing's Bad Luck from 2019, is uh, the biography of Warren Zevon, who's a personal hero of mine. The reason that I love Warren is primarily, I mean, the music's incredible, but he was an incredible lyricist and was very serious about his writing. And his uh, creative process was largely like that of an author or a poet, which I always thought was fascinating. And um, the thing about Warren Zevon is that uh, he was very cerebral and literary by nature. A lot of the background research included reading some of his favorite authors. As a child, he was actually a music prodigy and knew Igor Stravinsky and loved classical music and composed throughout his life. So listening to the classical music that affected him and reading these authors that affected his, his lyrics, real diverse authors such as uh, T.S. Eliot, crime writer Ross MacDonald, Martin Amos. Um, it was almost like taking a, a course in literature and art history to, to try and decipher Warren Zevon's music. John Bonham, on the other hand, what I think is the most fascinating is that he's more visceral and energetic and kinetic and as an incredible arranger and composer for a specific instrument. Um, writing about Bonham allowed me to go back and listen not only to uh, bands from the same area where he's from in Birmingham, uh, Redditch in England, um, but also to appreciate some of the jazz greats that influenced his playing when he was a kid, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and to listen to an instrument that I don't play myself uh, in a very different way to understand the context. The thing with both Warren Zevon and John Bonham that I think um, writing these two biographies back to back, now of course what they have in common is they're both hard rock musicians, uh, Warren could play hard rock, but you know Warren Zevon's career also, um, one of the things is that as a singular artist and as a singer songwriter, he's very famous for a brief time and then developed a cult following, more, more, more or less. John Bonham was part of one of the most successful rock bands of all time. So it was a challenge to write about a singular artist who was primarily a songwriter and then the member of an ensemble where you're really paying attention to someone who spoke through their instrument. But what they did have in common, and this is why I think in a way the two books, the two men as artists were totally different, but I think one of the reasons that I was able to approach it objectively is there were some common themes. Um, although Warren Zevon was born in Chicago and grew up uh, in the Los Angeles area, he, um, I mean, he was affected like a lot of, you know, rockers from the baby boomer era where he would see Elvis and the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and want to, and, and aspire to be in rock and roll. Bonham was the same way, but in England, and he's from that generation. So there was that common ground. And the most important is that what I, one of the things that I love about uh, Mr. Music Head is also that it's located right on the Sunset Strip, which is where so many of these classic performances took place and where these careers were even launched. The second one was, did you have any similarities or common threads that emerged between the two people who lived on the edge? The thing that was amazing writing about Warren Zevon is that he is unfortunately remembered not only for great music, but for his addictions, uh, alcoholism and, and the drugs, which was difficult to write about. But he achieved sobriety in the mid 80s primarily uh, for the rest of his life. John Bonham was uh, taken from us at way too young of an age. And I think you learn a lot about the rock and roll lifestyle and the industry itself when you write about two different people from the same era. And, you know, uh, what, what temptations are out there and, and what support systems are surrounding them. So I did see those similarities in both of them. Of course, uh, Warren's did have a happier ending, but John Bonham's legacy is just absolutely incredible. And I think I said in the book that, you know, 
no pun intended, but the echo of his drums is heard throughout generations, decades and decades of music after him. So I try and find the, the silver lining in both stories because they both have incredible legacies. But that's a great question. Uh, was there any blowback from anyone about doing a deep dive on one of the most revered drummers of all time? Well, nothing that I didn't anticipate. The thing is, is that with Led Zeppelin in particular, the members of the band are still very close knit and have never really been crazy about members of the press uh, from the very, very beginning. And I think that it's still the same way. They're very protective of their personal lives as they should be. And uh, Bonham's family is exactly the same way to protect his legacy. I think uh, what you meant by blowback is fans. Well, there's always gonna be that. You know, you're always gonna have arguments with your buddies about who the best drummer of all time was if it was. Bonham or Ginger Baker and, and Neil Peart and you, and you do hear those names. I'm assuming that blowback might actually be some of the same arguments that, that people have had about someone's legacy in music. So I, I think I would be ready for it. I think the only thing I would be not necessarily nervous about, but uh, ready to discuss, because I love talking about Bonham and Led Zeppelin. Uh, people may think as far as objectivity, whether the book focuses on the music enough or the personal life, I tried to put the music first and foremost. And John Bonham's incredible innovations as a drummer and his legacy in rock and roll. I, I hope I did him justice because he's a hero of mine and I hope that that shines through. But yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate that a lot of Warren Zevon fans did like the previous book. I'm hoping that John Bonham fans and Led Zeppelin fans will also uh, see what a, a loving portrait it is of, of him. So hopefully, my fingers are crossed. Uh, it's fun to see that Bonzo was friends with Bev the Van. Yep, Bev the Van, the hard-hitting drummer uh, from The Move and then the Electric Light Orchestra. Did they share any influences? You know, it's interesting. I love Bev the Van al also because I'm a big fan of ELO. And he and Bonham were friends for many, many years. They're both from Birmingham and they also knew a lot of the same people. Uh, one of Bev Bavan's best friends in real life is Tony Iommi from uh, Black Sabbath. Very, very, very close friends with John Bonham. Uh, as a matter of fact, Bonham was best man at Iommi's wedding. So they were all clusters of friends from the same area and they knew the same clubs. But in an interview, uh, Bev had actually said uh, that after he heard Bonham, he was one of his influences moving forward. And if you look, well, most of the hits, most of the, of the move and then later from ELO, it actually uh, does come after Bonham's influence, and it almost appears like Bev started to play a little bit harder, so I would believe that. But he's also a jazz guy, much like Ginger Baker and John Bonham. Jazz players were a huge influence for uh, Bev the Van. So, yeah, he's one of my favorites, too. Uh, since I'm from Motor City, I'm keen to know more about John's love of cars. Now, this is a cool question. John Bonham is famous primarily as one of the most important drummers in rock history, but at the same time, he was notorious for being a huge car enthusiast. And uh, to be honest with you, I think over time, he probably had anywhere between 50 and 100 cars. But at one time, because he would sell some and then get new ones, usually his personal collection like floated around the number 30. The first major awesome car that he bought for himself was after he signed with Zeppelin and the first album was guaranteed from Atlantic Records is he and Robert Plank got matching Jaguars. But it was only, uh, I think, one or two tours later that John bought himself his first Rolls Royce. I do love that in the 60s and 70s, maybe it's still this way, but I love that, you know, rock superstardom also went hand in hand with having these incredible car collections. And just as a point of interest, like I've reached, uh, researched the Beach Boys extensively. I'm a huge Beach Boys fan. I love Dennis Wilson in particular. After Good Vibrations went to number one, Brian Wilson bought matching Rolls Royces for every member of the Beach Boys, and that was Dennis Wilson's first one. He was the drummer for the Beach Boys, but then he went and bought the Corvette that once belonged to Sam Cooke. So you do see these, these threads that it, it's, a, it's a big status symbol. One of the best things that John had in his collection, uh, his car collection, was his 1923 Ford Model T that he had bought to replace a Corvette that was uninsurable when Zeppelin was on tour in Dallas. Uh, it was, he had installed into his Model T uh, a seven liter Chevrolet engine. And with that, he could go zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds. But fans of Zeppelin will recognize that this car is featured in the song Remains the Same during uh, John's vignette. Each member of the band had a vignette, a dreamlike scene where you could see what was most important to them when they weren't on the road. Well, John, first and foremost was his family and his friends 
Then it was also how his passion for drumming and then his love of cars. So within his vignette, you see him on the grounds of his farm with his family, and then juxtaposed back and forth is him racing this car while uh, he is playing Moby Dick on stage at Madison Square Garden. I did like this question too. Uh, was there a common trait to John Bonham's personality that came through with all of the interview, interviews that you had conducted and the conversations that you had? Yes. There, I'm very happy to say that there were two descriptions of John Bonham that I heard over and over again, and it was two separate words that would come up. And it was always how much fun he was, and it was also how professional. And one of the things that I think is most admirable about John Bonham is aside from his tremendous playing, he was known for being an incredible arranger and knowing his instrument inside and out. He tuned his own drum kit, uh, which many drummers would not do. And he also was the first uh, person to arrive at a sound check before any concert to make sure that his drums were perfectly tuned and audible from anywhere uh, in the arena. And I think that professionalism is what uh, his original reputation was really built upon and the seriousness with his instrument. So no matter who I spoke to, I always heard that John was a lot of fun and I also heard that he was a consummate professional as a drummer. Well, those were all the questions that had been sent to me. So again, my name is CM Cushions and I'm the author of Beast, John Bonham and the Rise of Led Zeppelin. And I hope that I will see all fans of rock and roll, music, art, and literature at Mr. Musichead on September 7th at 7 p.m. right in West Hollywood. Thank you.